at 0600 local time, a Russian BK-16 fast assault boat sat moored at Sevastopol's naval pier, completely unaware that six Ukrainian Beaver strike drones were already heading toward Crimea's southern coast with orders to punch a hole in the radar ring protecting it. In exactly 15 minutes, what began as just another drone raid would turn into one of the most devastating defeats over the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Unknown to the Ukrainian operators, though, eight miles away, a Russian Krasuka-4 electronic warfare vehicle had just activated. The lead operator tried moving his control stick left, but nothing happened. Then, three seconds later, the drone finally banked, nearly colliding with his wingman. Three seconds might not sound like much, but at 95 kilometers per hour, that's 80 meters of flying blind, the difference between threading buildings and slamming into them. The telemetry data showed altitude dropping without input, 190 meters, 180, 175. At 150 meters, he would crash into the cliffs along the coast. The Krasuka was able to do this by creating what's called a noise floor. Imagine trying to have a whispered conversation while standing next to a jet engine. The signal strength meter on the operator's console, usually showing a comfortable negative 70 dBm, think full bars on your phone plummeted to negative 110 dBm, one flickering bar that keeps disappearing. At negative 120 dBm, the link severs completely and the drone becomes a very expensive lawn dart. 10 more points of signal loss and this mission would end before it began. But Ukraine had learned this dance over three years of almost daily attacks. The drone started frequency hopping, jumping between 40 different channels every second in a pattern only the Ukrainian operators knew. The Russian EW operator watched his screen light up with detections as his equipment tried to follow each hop, analyze it, and redirect jamming power. Problem was, that process took 50 milliseconds and the drones hopped every 25 milliseconds. He was always swinging at where they were two hops ago like trying to swat a fly that teleports every time you raise your hand. The lead operator executed a burn-through maneuver, focusing all transmission power on a single frequency for two seconds, basically switching from a flashlight to a searchlight. The video flickered back, grainy and jumping like a 1980s TV with bad reception, but showing just enough. There was the radar complex, exactly where intelligence set. Four installations spread across two kilometers, but instead of empty coastline, they saw something that shouldn't be there. Through the static, he caught a glimpse of a rotating radar dish. A Tor M2 had just gone active, and its antenna was already turning toward them. If they wanted to make it to that BK-16, they had to somehow survive this first. The Tor M2 operator had been watching his screen all morning hunting for the characteristic signatures of incoming drones, small radar contacts moving 80 to 120 kilometers per hour at medium altitude, easy prey for his missiles. His scope showed nothing but ground returns and false contacts from trucks on the coastal highway. Ukrainian drones had learned to fly in the grass, below 30 meters altitude where radar physics completely breaks down. At that height, his sophisticated radar couldn't tell the difference between a drone and a delivery truck. That's because down at 30 meters, every radar pulse hit the ground and bounced back with such force it overwhelmed the receiver, like trying to see a firefly in front of a searchlight. The operator switched to the moving target indicator mode, basically telling the computer, ignore anything moving slower than 40 kilometers per hour. That's probably not a drone. The Ukrainian formation immediately throttled back to 35 kilometers per hour. Now they were invisible again moving too slow to trigger the filter, but too fast to be ground vehicles. It's these kinds of games that drove Russian operators insane. Every countermeasure had a countermeasure. Then physics forced everyone's hand. Power lines stretched across the valley at 25 meters height, hit them and go down easily, or climb over them and become visible. The lead beaver popped up to 60 meters for exactly three seconds. The tour operator's screen lit up like a Christmas morning. Six contacts bearing 247, range 2.4 kilometers, altitude 60 and climbing. His fingers danced across the controls, the launcher swiveling to track, and the 9M338 missile erupted from its tube. 
the missile accelerated to Mach 2.5 in under two seconds. That's 850 meters per second, crossing a kilometer before you can count to two. But the Ukrainian drone was already diving, dropping back to 20 meters like a rock thrown off a cliff. That's because the TORS missiles need 15 meters minimum altitude for the proximity fuse to arm. It's a safety feature to prevent the warhead from detonating right after launch and destroying its own vehicle. Below 15 meters, that sophisticated missile becomes nothing more than a 165-kilogram tennis ball. The 9M338 screamed overhead, its seeker head frantically searching for a target that had vanished into the ground clutter, before self-destructing eight seconds later in a puff of smoke and shrapnel over an empty field. However, this was no secret to the Russians. They had positioned two TOR batteries to cover this approach, but terrain had forced them three kilometers apart with a ridge line between them. On paper, this looked fine. Each TOR could see 25 kilometers out and engage targets from 1.5 to 15 kilometers. Overlapping coverage, no gaps. But here's where physics had betrayed them. The missiles need that 1.5 kilometers to arm their warheads and start pulling 30G turns. Any closer and they're still accelerating, basically still waking up. This created two circles of dead space, each 1.5 kilometers in radius around each vehicle. The Ukrainian operators had discovered something beautiful. If you flew exactly between the two tours, staying about 1.4 kilometers from each one, you threaded a corridor where neither could engage. Too close for their missiles to arm, but the ridgeline meant they couldn't reposition quickly to get a better angle. It's like walking between two guard dogs on chains. Get the distance just right, and neither can reach you. But this meant flying perfectly straight for 10 seconds, no evasion maintaining precise distance from both threats. One mistake, drift 200 meters either direction, and you're suddenly in someone's engagement envelope. At 95 kilometers per hour, those 10 seconds felt like hours. But threading that gap wasn't just survival. It lined them up on the only safe axis towards Sevastopol's harbor and the pier where the B-16 was tied up. And this is exactly what they were aiming for. They punched right through the gap just as a missile launched, passing harmlessly behind them. But clearing the tour screen meant entering something worse. Dead ahead, a Panzer S-1 air defense vehicle sat waiting, its radar already locked onto all six drones, painting them with targeting radiation. At 2.5 kilometers, they were entering its optimal engagement envelope. And unlike the tours, the Panzer was specifically designed to destroy small drones. The Panzer operator had been watching the drone formation dance through the tour coverage for the past minute, his finger hovering over the launch button, studying how they moved, learning their evasion patterns. At exactly 2.2 kilometers, textbook engagement range, he launched two 57E6 E missiles simultaneously. This wasn't random. Paired launches forced targets to evade in predictable ways. If a drone breaks left to avoid the first missile, it flies right into the second. The missiles exploded from their tubes at Mach 3, crossing the first kilometer before the Ukrainian operators even processed the launch warning. One kilometer per second meant physics was not on Ukraine's side. The first missile locked onto the third drone in formation, following steering commands uploaded from the Panzer's radar for the initial phase. For 1.5 seconds, the missile flew on remote control, then switched to its infrared seeker headed for terminal guidance. That's when everything went wrong for the Russians. The 57E6E was engineered in the 1990s to destroy fighter jets, big aluminum tubes with engines burning at 600 degrees Celsius that stood out against the sky like flares. These Ukrainian drones had electric motors running at 40 degrees, only five degrees warmer than the morning air. The infrared seekers swept back and forth in increasingly desperate arcs, hunting for heat that barely existed like trying to find a candle flame in a room full of light bulbs. The third drone operator pulled six Gs in a banking turn, enough force that the composite airframe creaked audibly in the video feed. The missile passed eight meters overhead, close enough that the camera caught the exhaust trail. The proximity fuse, designed to detect aircraft aluminum and trigger the warhead, completely missed the carbon fiber composite construction. No detonation just an expensive rocket continuing into the sky until physics brought it down. The second missile found the fifth drone in formation, 
This time, the proximity fuse worked. The warhead detonated 12 meters away, transforming into an expanding fear of 200 tungsten fragments. Most missed, but three fragments punched through the fuselage. The video feed started spinning wildly. Sky, ground, sky, ground, before cutting to static. First loss. The Panzer operator immediately launched two more missiles. The third drone, still recovering from its 6G maneuver, couldn't evade twice. Direct impact turned it into a brief orange fireball and falling debris. Two drones down in five seconds, four survivors pressing forward. The Panzer's twin 30mm autocannon spun up with a mechanical whine, each barrel cycling at 2,500 rounds per minute. That's 83 explosive shells per second per barrel, filling the sky with steel. The targeting computer ran its calculations. Drones at 1,800 meters, speed 95 kilometers per hour, crossing angle 30 degrees. With shells traveling 850 meters per second, they needed 2.1 seconds to reach the targets. In those 2.1 seconds, a drone could travel 55 meters. So the computer aimed 55 meters ahead. Perfect math that assumed targets would fly predictably. Instead, every 1.5 seconds, the operators threw in random inputs. Dive left, climb right, roll and bank. Never the same pattern twice. The Panzer's targeting computer needed exactly 1.5 seconds of steady flight to generate a firing solution. It never got them. The system was perpetually solving yesterday's problem, aiming where drones had been two seconds ago, not where they were going. The Russian gunner abandoned computer assistance, switching to manual control and walking his fire in expanding spiral patterns, hoping statistics would succeed where precision failed. Shrapnel pinged off composite hulls like deadly hail. A fragment tore through the second drone's control surface, immediately creating a constant left pull the operator had to fight every second. But physics has rules even the best air defense can't break. At 500 meters distance, the drones dove to just 10 meters altitude. Treetop height, the Panzer's guns physically couldn't depress below minus 5 degrees without hitting the vehicle's own hull. At that range and height, simple trigonometry put the drones in an untouchable blind spot. Four survivors pushed through, the radar complex looming ahead. The cannons fell silent, unable to track targets they couldn't physically aim at. The most advanced air defense system in the Russian arsenal, defeated by basic geometry. The route to the Russian BK-16 appeared to be open. But true to Russian form, they always had a manual backup. Three Russian soldiers with Ilga shoulder-fired missiles had been crouched between concrete barriers since the first warning, watching the Panzer's engagement, knowing they were the last line of defense before the radar complex. The lead soldier powered on his launcher, the cooling unit humming as liquid nitrogen dropped the infrared seeker to minus 196 degrees Celsius, cold enough to turn air into liquid, necessary to detect the minute temperature differences between aircraft and sky. He found the lead Ukrainian drone on his site at 800 meters, waiting for the solid lock tone that meant a guaranteed hit. Instead, his earpiece warbled like a dying smoke detector, Solid tone for one second, nothing for two, weak chirp for one. The drone's pathetic heat signature kept vanishing against the background. When it flew over water still radiating yesterday's warmth at 38 degrees, those 40-degree motors disappeared completely. But when it crossed over land at 33 degrees, suddenly there was marginal contrast. Water background, no lock. Land background, weak lock. The seeker was hunting for something that thermally didn't exist. That's because the ILGA was designed to destroy helicopters and jets with exhaust temperatures exceeding 300 degrees. Not glorified model airplanes with motors cooler than a laptop computer. Its seeker head expected to find heat plumes, jet wash, anything that screamed, I'm an aircraft, against the sky. These drones whispered their presence, thermally speaking. The soldier fired anyway, hoping the missile's proximity fuse would compensate for the weak lock, a prayer more than a tactic. The missile streaked out, its seeker head sweeping in increasingly desperate circles, chasing phantom heat signatures created by morning temperature inversion. That weird atmospheric condition where warm air sits on top of cold air, creating mirages made of temperature instead of light. The missile veered toward a warm air pocket, then another, then splashed harmlessly into the water 50 meters behind the oblivious drone. The other two soldiers lowered their launchers without firing. 
If one Ilga couldn't maintain lock in these conditions, they'd all fail. They watched helplessly as the drones lined up on their targets, all defenses exhausted, nothing left but small arms fire that had almost zero chance of success. At 615 hours, the lead beaver reached the P-18 Tarek early warning radar, the system that could detect aircraft 360 kilometers away, giving Sevastopol 15 minutes warning of any incoming attack. Without this radar, the entire defensive network would be blind to threats until they were practically overhead. The drone dove straight at the rotating antenna array, accelerating to maximum speed for the final approach. When it struck, the warhead's shape charge detonated, creating what weapons engineers call the Monroe Effect. The copper cone inside collapsed into a hypersonic jet moving at 8,000 meters per second. 20 seconds later, the second drone lined up on the Nebo-U surveillance radar, the crown jewel of Russian radar technology that could supposedly track stealth aircraft at 600 kilometers and coordinate every SAM battery in Crimea. Destroying this would be like poking out the eye that watched over the entire Black Sea. Every soldier within 500 meters opened fire. PKM machine guns, AK-47s, even pistols. The math of hitting a target moving 95 kilometers per hour at 300 meters distance meant they might as well have been throwing rocks. But they tried anyway. The drone slammed into the Nebo U's phased array, the shape charge turning hundreds of precisely calibrated radar elements into expensive metallic confetti that rained down across the complex. The third drone, the one with damaged control surfaces that pulled constantly left, fought toward the N6L6E cheeseboard engagement radar. This was the S-400's brain, the system that turned those launcher vehicles from expensive tubes into Russia's best air defense system. Without this radar, 32 missiles worth $500 million would become useless, unable to track or engage any target. A ZU-23-2 anti-aircraft gun had been dragged into position, its twin barrels spraying 23mm shells in predetermined box patterns. The drone flew through the steel rain, impacting moments later. Secondary explosions rippled through the installation as capacitor banks discharged and power systems failed in Cascade. With all the primary targets destroyed, the final drone banked toward the naval pier where a B-16 patrol boat sat moored. These boats were the hunters of Ukrainian special forces, carrying 19 naval infantry for rapid coastal response, armed with machine guns and grenade launchers. Each boat lost meant one less quick reaction force to defend against infiltration. Seconds later, despite incoming fire from watchstanders on board, the final drone struck amidships, detonating just below the waterline. In a matter of 15 minutes, Ukraine had dealt a huge blow to Russian air defenses around Sevastopol, clearing the path for the continued destruction of the Black Sea Fleet. Bye for now.